He would interest himself in the cut of her fringe, the colour of her makeup, the kind of beer she sold, and even far away behind her reflected in a mirror, the colour of the trapeze artist's socks. A modern art would be one that took these things, these details of fashion and consumption and display, to be the only kind of history that was paintable any longer. They were history in its late 19th century form. History as a parade of images, history as appearance, history as an anxious and accelerating turnover of signs and fashions and superficies. This was the subject of modern art. This was what it chose to show of the world. But in addition, and presumably because its subject matter was appearance in this social form, modern painting would also take up a quite distinct attitude to its own means, to the actual paint and canvas which it used to make the appearances, and therefore to insist on their superficiality. The means of painting would thus become the second subject of modern art, perhaps even the first, alongside the imagery of fashion and consumption. The picture insists on the fact that it is painted, the fact that it is an illusion made out of flats and films of colour put down on a single surface. And the provisional, abbreviated quality of the actual putting on of paint is only reinforced if we look at the way the picture as a whole is put together. Or rather, not put together at all. Behind the barmaid, there is apparently a mirror. But the things that figure upon it as reflections, the bottles, the back view of the barmaid, the front of a customer ordering a drink, these purposely don't fit with the objects they presumably belong to. The barmaid never quite agrees with her image in the glass. And if she doesn't go, what is the viewer supposed to make of the man in the top right corner holding a cane and wearing a glossy top hat? How are we expected to accept him as our own reflection, standing four square in the space we occupy, facing the barmaid head on? The picture appears at first sight to conjure up an illusion of space and light and depth and reflections. But the more we look, the less that illusion works. The solids and reflections disappear and what is left is a series of separate flat shapes. And that flatness, finally, is given its own ironic, half-playful signs within the picture itself. Look at the brushy, opaque, undazzling circles of white, which stand unconvincingly for electric light. Or look at the flat red triangles attached, or not quite attached, to the labels on the bottles of baths. There might seem to be a connection straight away between the flatness of the way of painting here and the form of life which we are being shown. It is as if modern art, in Manet's case, is out to contrive a relationship between modern subject matter and modern form. If I look at the bar, and particularly at the barmaid's pose and expression, I'm tempted to say that the message appears to be that modern subject matter is modern form. In other words, that the truth of the life allowed to the barmaid is that flatness, that tissue of unsatisfactory illusion. And hasn't Manet made the relation between form and content quite clear? Isn't it obvious that flatness in this case has a meaning? a particular meaning to do with the barmaid's blankness and boredom and disguise. And doesn't the picture insist 
by its very formality and grandness that what it shows is not just a marginal case of modernity, not just a problem for barmaids at music halls, but a typical case. A typical case, I'm inclined to say, of the public life allowed in a capitalist consumer society. The barmaid is modern, in other words, in the way we all are now. We are all of us obliged to manage our appearances in a market situation and less and less sure what the other person's appearances might signify. We haven't a public life at all in any strong sense of the word public. We haven't a place in which our various selves can be exchanged, recognised, taken up and changed by other people in some form of collective work or play. The best we can do in public is, so the phrase has it, to give nothing away. That's what the barmaid does. That is what makes her modern. What I've offered up to now is a reading of one picture by Manet, an argument of some sort about its form and content and their connection. I fancy it's a plausible one, and I certainly prefer it to most of those on offer in the modernist textbooks, all those oohs and ahs about the fruit and champagne, and all that stuff about the bar and the barmaid being merely a pretext for painting. If Manet wanted simply to paint, and I suppose he did occasionally, he made do with pretexts less elaborate and strange than this one. The question nonetheless remains, is my reading the right one? Or to put it more specifically, was it the one that functioned explicitly or implicitly in 1882 in the curious complex transaction between painter and public in which meanings are first of all made the honest answer to this question is that i'm not sure the evidence for an answer is lacking above all the evidence of what people critics said and wrote at the time they said and wrote remarkably little, not enough to confirm or invalidate the meanings I've just proposed. So I want to go back instead to a case, a related case, in which the evidence is thicker on the ground. Let me try to ask the same kind of question of Manet's most famous, not to say notorious, picture, the one he sent to the Salon of 1865, nearly 20 years before the bar, and to which he gave the enigmatic title, Olympia. When Olympia was first shown in the Salon, it caused an almighty scandal. It was surrounded, so the papers said, by angry or hilarious crowds. It became the butt of every hack commentator and caricaturist. By the end of the summer, no less than 70 separate people had had their say or penned their view of Olympia, her black maid, her spitting cat, and her oversized bunch of flowers. Now, wouldn't we expect those critics to be clear from the sheer look of the thing exactly what Olympia's form and content meant? One thing the critics in 1865 did know that this was an image of a prostitute, and not of a mysterious and distant courtesan, but of an actual disabused 20-year-old from Breda Street or Batignolles. And isn't that the significance of Olympia's unflinching look, her incorrigible matter-of-factness at her own nudity and our looking at it? Doesn't the awkward jagged, almost comic flattening of the picture's spaces and volumes, doesn't that have to do with what is shown, with the kind of woman, the kind of transaction, the kind of brazen and empty presentation of self involved in the business of sitting on a bed and inviting the client's verdict? Again, in a similar way to the bar, isn't the sheer grandness and formality of the image meant to suggest that it tells the truth of modernity in general, that once again we are all Olympias now. 
This is a list of leading questions to which the answer appears to be consistently yes. But beware in this case of the obvious answer. For it isn't at all clear that yes is the right answer if we are asking these questions about Manet's meanings in 1865. It's not at all clear, to put the point a bit over dramatically perhaps, that Olympia had a meaning at all at the time of its first showing. It provoked a reaction, certainly. People wanted to say something about it, to call it names, to semaphore their disgust and bewilderment. This Olampia, a sort of female gorilla, a grotesque in India rubber surrounded with black, apes on a bed in a state of complete nudity, in the horizontal attitude of the Venus of Titian. The left arm rests on the body in the same way, except for the hand, which is flexed in a sort of shameless contraction. The critic in the Grand Journal is quite explicit as to the nature of Manet's crime in Olympia. He has done dirt on the normal, established, unquestionable language of the nude, the language established by Titian. He's made nudity over into nakedness, into a shameless, rigid, aggressive, disorganized and actual body, a body as real and unyielding in its sexuality as that hand is, flexed uncomfortably across the genitals. A hand which insists on what it is that it hides, rather than pretending that there's nothing there to hide at all in the way that Titian's Venus manages to do. We could almost say in a case like this, that once the critic is deprived of the nude, he simply can't see the picture, the body, the form, the way of painting, at all. What he